To think Nickelodeon would shelve a show like this early means that there must be something that we don't know. This was a very promising show that taught morals, it had a good art style, and brought in online artists with little experience to gather talented and a hungry team led by a great creator. So what happened? Well, let's figure it out. Harvey Beaks is about the title character Harvey and his adventures with his best friends, Fee and Foo, two odd eccentric characters who appear to not have a home or family. A lot of the episodes center around a fun but also moral guided experience, similar to The Loud House. Now the show is created by C.H. Greenblatt, who started off as an additional storyboard artist for Spongebob and eventually ended up creating Band Geeks, one of the most critically acclaimed episodes. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Patrick, mayonnaise is not an instrument. Horseradish is not an instrument either. He was also the creator behind Chowder, a very weird but funny show which centered around its title character and his adventures. Upon that show stopping production, he went to focus on his new show, coming up with ideas, and oddly enough, this show is the polar opposite of Chowder. While Chowder was a very absurdist, meta, weird, and colorful show, which had a lot of adventures inside, Harvey Beaks was a relaxed, moral-driven, and warmer show overall, which wants to tell a very emotionally driven story. And what interests me the most about the show is not the what, but the who. With Tumblr, it was really inspiring to see all these artists I'd never heard of who were so good and were putting their work out there. It actually kept me really inspired to see all that stuff. And I started making a list of people that I, that I really liked and that I thought next time I do something, they might be right for this. Greenblatt was always a fan of trying something new. And while on Harvey Beaks, he wanted to extend to new people who didn't have much animation experience. This is no different than when he switched from a very traditional paper-based approach to storytelling than a digital approach. We started digitally storyboarding here a few years ago. And um, you know, with the, with, the in, with the introduction of the Cintiq tablet, that allowed us to start working digitally, both for uh, cleanup, design, and then we transitioned into storyboarding. We find that, you know, before, uh, when I was storyboarding, I would draw a panel and then realize that I, I wanted to frame it much wider or, you know, um, go in a lot tighter than I had gone, and I'd be running back and forth to the copier or throwing down a new piece of paper and tracing over it. I traditionally had been just covered in paper and pencil grease and all this stuff, and now I'm uh, just on this nice clean Cintiq. You know, it's easy to drop it onto the server and give it to the next person. It's easy to um, to export it as a PDF and send it to the executives and have them take a look at it, send it back. So, so there's a definite savings in workflow. Greenblatt is a man who adapts and it shows with its benefits, with many people considering him one of the funniest writers that they've met, but we're not there yet. Chowder would come to its unfortunate end around 2010. So with this show, it, it started with a little kind of evil looking gremlin a little funny guy who eventually became Fu. One drawing I did, he had a he had a little helmet. I thought, oh, it's funny, the bird. The bird is sort of like this little safe character. And the more I started to do it, I realized, oh, I relate to the bird. I'm totally the bird. And once I had that, I said, there's the show. I knew Bad it. Seeds was an unaired 11-minute pilot commissioned by Nickelodeon to determine the potential of Harvey, Fu, and Fee that eventually aired in September of 2013 online. Although his concepts initially started with Fu, a very crazy, wild, carefree boy with no manners, he realized that this character needed another character that would dynamically make both characters work better together. And in comes Harvey. Bad Seeds does not appear to be on the internet anymore, at least not in an accessible way that would make it easy for anyone to look it up actually i did end up finding it thanks to archive.org i don't know how this isn't anywhere else on the internet it's not on youtube it's not even on any of the other blogs it kind of seems like they wanted to delete this and basically erase any history of harvey beaks they switched the name to Harvey Beaks because copyright or something like that, and it was pushed as Nickelodeon's newest show to become loved, successful, and hang with the juggernauts at the time. And I use the word juggernauts lightly.
Hurry Weeks came out around the time that Sanjay and Craig, Rabbit's Invasion, Breadwinners, The Penguins of Madagascar, TMNT 2012, Tough Puppy, Winx Club, Kung Fu Panda, Legends of Awesomeness, and The Fairly Odd Parents were still airing new episodes. Now while these shows were on the same network, they're also competitors, and one thing that stuck out to me right away is that very little of these shows are calm. Sanjay and Craig, Breadwinners, and The Fairly Odd Parents, at least at this point, were all sugar high crazy, wacky humor. Tough Puppy was hyper as well, and it didn't leave too much time to let things settle in, unlike Danny Phantom, created by the same person. Kung Fu Panda, Rabbits, and Penguins of Madagascar, since connected to a franchise, it also didn't leave too much to sink in. TMNT and Winx Club would have been the only shows to have a calmer atmosphere by comparison at least, but the former was an action show and the latter is weird, as it only seems to start airing on Nickelodeon at least in its third or fourth season, which gives it that leeway to develop stories. So Harvey Beak sticks out by not wanting to grab your attention within the first five seconds, allowing you to breathe and enjoy the show for what it is. And Pichu, its first episode does that. Imagine yourself as a new viewer, or if you've never watched a show, stick with me here. There's this really nice, well-behaved boy, Harvey, and his rascal friends, who are loyal and also very friendly towards him. And because of their reputation as unkempt, rude troublemakers, Fee and Fu, they're not allowed in this lake. And this creates a giant uprising of water, something similar to a geyser, I don't know. It blows them and only them out of the water because they are banned from the lake and forced by this sea monster. You know, we sea monsters have made great strides in the fields of science and literature. All Harvey wants to do is have fun with his friends, but he's too nice to be banned from the lake. Harvey's character centers around optimism, but naivety, because after all, he's still young. The sea monster doesn't ban him, because even he can see that this kid is too good-natured to warrant being banned. So they go through various antics that test Harvey's innocence and strong morals. Okay, the best way to get on someone's nerves is to just stare at him. Really? Hey, Jeremy, I'm just gonna stare at you. Oh. oh! Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just gonna keep staring. Oh! That went great! Jeremy's such a nice dude. I would compare this to Walking Small, at least the first half of Walking Small. His antics were at most inconveniencing those who tried to coach him, because he still viewed what he did as being nice. And what I enjoyed about this episode the most is the connection between this blow up, sort of water action that happens when you're banned from the lake, and Harvey wanting to do it in a way that doesn't make people not like him. Despite the fact that he can simply dump this trash in the lake, getting everyone upset at him, this water trick is just a trick and it's not worth sabotaging everyone else to get. And it took him realizing that, not his friends. So unbeknownst to him, Fee and Fu get everyone to lie about him, getting him banned from the lake regardless. And the way he reacts to being a monster is, uh, interesting to say the least. Oh man, I, I just wanted to go but you. And, and now my friends hate me. I'm an empty shell of a person. Whoa. Yeah. You need to stop this! You dare give me the butt! One thing that does drag over from Chowder is the way that the jokes are paced and told. Even the butt part doesn't seem too stupid. What made it was the reaction, and the way that Harvey was animated doing it. But even more interesting though, I definitely noticed that Harvey was not himself, because Harvey wants to please people, and within failing that, he felt like a different person. He gets banned because of his antics, and gets to use this geyser thing at the end.
So with such a highly rated episode in comparison, it was set off to become a family favorite by telling warm and fun stories that anyone could get into. And I think the biggest challenge would be to not be too boring. Considering the problem with a lot of hyper shows is that they get too sugar high for their own good, the opposite is true for a calmer show. And with a great control of pace, this should not be an issue. Despite the first episode being the only time they receive ratings that high, they managed to maintain a steady fan base, growing more and more consistent as the show went on. However, However, one thing that interests me is, well, look at these shows. I took the shows that premiered before and after Harvey Beaks. So that would be Breadwinner, Sanjay and Craig, Pig Goat, Banana Cricket, pretty much those. And check out their declines. It's a lot more steady in the beginning. So my first question would be, why did it drop so much? And I can think of a few reasons. Nickelodeon marketed this show around the much more hyperactive shows and getting your foot in the door would be easy with one of the biggest animation companies in the world. But I think the issue is, maybe you were not getting what was said on the tin, so to speak. Speak. And to make it clear, I'm going to use one of my own videos. So let's take my unpopular opinions total drama video. Now this would be the second video in the series, however, it shows a pretty much nude Heather in a thumbnail. However, it delivers on the promise both directly and indirectly. We do talk about Heather in the video, as it was one of the hot takes. So we do talk about what you see in the thumbnail, but also within the first 10 seconds, you see how that particular pose was led up to. Thus, I deliver on the promise, and you get a good engaging video after. And to be honest with you guys, I was not interested in Harvey Beaks when it came out, and it's something I regret. At the time, I can just remember seeing it as an average show that didn't appeal to me the way that shows like Gumball, Clarence, and DuckTales did. More so, it just seemed like Nickelodeon at the time was putting out shows that were, let's just say, not for me. So it was safe to say that if I didn't like Pig Goat, Banana Cricket, Breadwinners, or Sanjay and Craig, I might not have liked Harvey Beaks. But I was wrong. It wasn't more of the same. It was a diamond in the rough and it continues with episodes like Yampians. You guys ready for family game night? Heck yeah, just so long as we're not playing. 17th century provincial haunted yam harvest! Yampians is a very heartwarming episode about a simple tale of winning versus having fun. They play this yam board game that is very complex, but also very fun and amplified through the fact that they do play the game, they show themselves portrayed in the game, which gives it that nice touch and gives you that extra immersion needed for an episode episode that is going to center around this for its majority. The twist in this episode is rather than teaming up with his mom and face Fee and Fu who don't like this game because they always lose, Harvey and his mom split up and Harvey seems with his dad who is awful at the game. I'll plant the yam seed into the ground. Dad, that's not a seed! You used a haunted crystal! Ah, there's ghosts everywhere! Well, I guess I better cast a spell. What? No way, Dad! You're gonna the biggest counter argument you can have here is that the episodes tell stories that many of us have heard before. But I would argue that unlike other shows, with Harvey, you're getting these stories told with some variations combined with a large amount of fascinating characters, great music composition, and this feeling of warmness that I otherwise would not find in any Nick show until maybe, just maybe the Mighty Bee. If not, Hey Arnold, at the very least. I'm surprised the show doesn't get compared to Hey Arnold more. Everything down to the head shape, being this irregular, to this sense of childhood innocence. It's just down pat within Harvey Beaks. Just take the rugged environment of New York and replace it with the magical forest. Now yes, you can kind of see where Harvey losing for once is going to go. He's going to feel like he wants to win more than having fun, like he said. Which is the opposite of what he told Fee and Fu. And this opens his eyes and transforms him. Whoopsies! I have dropped it on the ground! I have dropped it on the ground! Oh, wow! It says I get to switch teams! What? Excuse me. Pardon me. Oh, actually, I should go check on the rest of those cookies. <laughs> Out on the porch. You guys have fun? Besides Harvey doing something a little rude, this whole sequence was pretty funny to me. Obviously they make up and they all learn from this, and Harvey takes losing in a different light. So as you can see, these episodes have a set story in the way that they're told with great characters that all have their potential recognized. But sometimes that isn't always the case. Mushroom pizza? What's it doing out here? Ooh, maybe somebody dropped it. Whoa! 
Oh yeah, this episode was pretty hard to sit through. I wouldn't call it the worst, but it does a few things that really goes against what the show offers. Firstly, everything that can go wrong does go wrong, just to line up in place, including any sensible characters being removed from the situation that would stop it immediately. Harvey's mom literally goes to work in the middle of this episode, when if Harvey and her talked, this episode would be over. Misunderstanding episodes are always weird with me, and you can see some of the worst misunderstanding episodes in The Loud House. No such luck was a really bad offender of the misunderstanding concept. Everyone in the episode just so happened to believe a certain notion until told otherwise because the story demands it. Your bad luck, Lincoln! You can't come! Even these two, these two right here, who often steer Harvey one way or another are just tiny specks in this episode that do nothing other than to inconvenience Harvey's mom. Why are you... Irving? Yep. <sighs> Irving. WHY IS IT BUZZING?! Thinking towards the story's logic, if Harvey's dad left his phone at his house, what does smashing the phone do for anyone? If Fee and Fu were not there, she still would have to confront Harvey and his dad. Not only that, but for a magical force, this whole Yeti thing was so underwhelming. The only positive for me is that we got to see into Reuter's family. They're very, um, action-oriented and, um, colorful. I love their accent, Australian, and they're very tough. Harvey, you're a genius! Come on, twins, we're going someplace safe! Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot about this egg. Um, so, I tend to look at concepts that interest me first for episodic shows, so I, I hopped back and forth when binging this show. And the first time I saw this egg was in Yampions, when Harvey talked to the egg. This egg right here holds a family member, Michelle Beeks, and during this first season, she stays as this egg, pretty much for everyone to either protect or speak through. Now, I'm pretty sure I know the question you're gonna ask. No, no, I don't need to do anything special to get up looking this adorable, but thank you for the compliment. But the question you should ask is, does she hatch eventually? Yes, actually in the season two premiere. Yes, the first season did so well that a season two and three started days after season one, which implied that a lot of episodes were being made while season one crushed it. In fact, Harvey Beaks even stuck in chowder, in a way. So this was the last episode of season one with both pairs talking about birthdays. The first 11 minute episode focuses on Harvey's birthday and the second focuses on Fee and Fu's first birthday. Like I said earlier, they don't have parents, so they didn't have any birthdays prepared for them. Before you get your pants in the twist, I should say that this chowder cameo is small. And when watching this episode, I was looking around, looking for chowder, thinking to myself, is he gonna have a speaking role? No, he's kind of right there. It's at the end of the episode, where a character that looks oddly similar is seen. The actual character themselves, with their face or even their voice? No. So let's talk about one of the biggest episodes. I think in the show, from a ratings and story standpoint, this egg. It's built up that this egg contains another member of the Beak's household. So the episode where it hatches signifies a big change, but also a big addition to the community. Enter the new Bugaboo. We have to get ready for the Bugaboo. The bugaboo? You mean me? No, the baby, silly. Oh, but I thought I was the bugaboo. Wow, this episode was light enough to be your standard Harvey Beaks episode, but to a fan, this is a big episode. In fact, no, this is THE big episode. I know they have a one hour special later on, and they hit their highest rated episode just a few episodes after this, but just think about this for a second. This egg was built up for the entirety of season one, and the show so far is centered in on Harvey's family, or just the fact that a family has a big influence on you. I mean, just look at Fee and Fu. No family, so they act the way that they do. This show is really big on family and positive influences being something crucial to your life. So of course, this episode throws all of that into a blender and just goes. Imagine this carrot is your parents' love. Ah, your siblings took it all! I used to have the whole carrot, but they took it. Cause that's what siblings do. Yes, this is an episode made for children to watch on Nickelodeon. It honestly was a heavy episode in comparison to other episodes that were a lot lighter and kinder. Harvey cracks under the pressure and gives the baby away. And this is the turning point of the show. Everything so far has led up to big situations like this. Because here, rather than getting a perspective of siblings from one friend, he gets the best example of siblings from Fee and Fu. Despite not having parents, they appear to be okay. Yes, they are rude and not the best people to 
spend time around, but they aren't unwatchable in the slightest. In fact, it is that self-sufficient attitude that I like about them. But back to the baby. Harvey lets it get kicked into this giant pile of egg-shaped rocks, and honestly, I thought at first, this person right here kicked it into a giant egg hatch or something. Little sister of mine, I'm your big brother Harvey, and I'll always be there for you. Cause that's what big brothers do. And with that, the baby appears to be hatching, and they do a great job building up to it. From composition to just having you wait until the end just to see it, as it should. This is Michelle Beeks, and she's not happy with Harvey. This blew my mine. This means that throughout Yampions and every other episode, she can understand them despite being in that egg. She's not happy with Harvey, and Harvey spends this episode learning about this new addition in his life. I'm glad we're on this baby talk because I want to go through an exercise with you. As a creator yourself, most likely, imagine you have a show idea and you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. It does well, it garners a fan base, and his work of yours stood out from the crowd. It delivered memorable episodes, and despite Nick not seeing too much in it, it performed well in the era of dying TV. And then one day, you wake up and realize that the thing that you poured seven years into moves into Nicktoons to essentially die. And you find this out in a tweet. I'm so sorry something you poured your whole heart into got crapped on by people who only cares about what sells. You and Harvey both deserve better. And I really do hope you can find it, even if it's in other shows and projects. The sad part is that we all felt like this show could have done well, if it had been given a chance. But here's the thing, Nick will have aired Harvey just barely over 15 hours total for all of 2016. They run a lot more of 15 hours of Spongebob each week and expect us to compete with the global phenomenon 18 years old. Honestly, if I ran a network that way, I would be ashamed and disgusted with myself. This post since has been deleted, among other angry internet posts from the creator, and Nickelodeon has since forced Greenblatt to apologize for his behavior. It's upsetting when Cartoon Brew posted that anti-Nick article. You defended him and this is apparently the thanks they give you. I'm so sick of Nick wanting quote the next Spongebob to come instantly. Spongebob took a while to get popular. If they had that mentality in 1999, they would have never gotten their biggest cash cow. And who knows how many Nicktoons since could have been bigger than Spongebob if they didn't give up on them quickly. That defense was force. I was taken into an office, given a stern lecture, and told I had to go on Cartoon Brew and write a reply. And yeah, it's funny how the network easily forgets that it took a couple of seasons for Spongebob to catch on. Now they're too big to fail and they need that instant hit. They're a junkie and they're stuck on the needle of Spongebob, but like all junkies, they'll wither and die if they don't clean up. And clean up they did not because it does appear that the Loud House is trying to be their new Spongebob. They never quit, but unlike Spongebob, I don't think the Loud House has that longevity. It's not that funny, it's not that influential, and I'm sure it aired more than 15 hours a week on many weeks after its initial launch. I don't believe Harvey Beaks went down because of ratings, but I can tell you this, it died. Harvey Beaks from that point on pretty much received a tenth, if that, of the ratings it initially had if they were lucky. It seems as though Nickelodeon the animation studio and Nickelodeon the network corporation were on different wavelengths with their opinion of Harvey Beaks. It seems like there was something more that just never came out. At least with Chowder, the common reason that I'm seeing a lot is that they were just in a bad place at a bad time, around CN Real and their demos changed and Chowder was not satisfying their target demos. For that, I begrudgingly understand, but for this, what did this do that made Nickelodeon sabotage it to fail? And I also want to send a rant on Spongebob becoming a phenomena, especially because he was there. He was writing on season two. People do not take this into account nearly enough, but Spongebob was not a powerhouse out of the gate. Yes, it did receive a movie after the third season, but I can assure you a lot of that influence came from the latter half of the second season towards the movie. Before that, it was just like Harvey Beaks. It was on the road to success 
process. It just needed more time to grow. It would have satisfied the demos if you aired it more so they can see it and get used to it. Nickelodeon has such a terrible cold feet syndrome and this was one of its worst cases. To give a creator a lecture that they shouldn't throw you under the bus when you essentially cut their life short is infuriating. I'm annoyed that we've been robbed of a third, fourth, and fifth season from amazing shows because Nickelodeon, a multi-million dollar company, can't package their own crap right. And it gets even worse when you realize that Nickelodeon isn't in third place, they're in first place. So why are they so frantic to find the next Spongebob when they don't give the shows they already have a chance? Plus as we see with Cartoon Network and Disney, you don't need another Spongebob to prosper. And it could be argued that by having Spongebob on so long, the overall quality of your network dipped because of this warped viewpoint. I always advocate for YouTubers to stick to a narrow topic to grow because it gives you a steady relationship with the viewer. But when you stick to one thing and just that one thing with no experimentation or risk, well, you'll end up like half of the dead Let's Play channels on this website. My eyes were open recently. It's all about sticking to a core message. And that message for me is our stories amplified. This was a creator who wasn't afraid to make a show that was different, to make a show that instilled values, but not in a preachy way, to make a show that is episodic so it's accessible to all, but give small arcs and developments to keep longtime fans rewarded. All of this because Nickelodeon didn't see the potential in it. So let's talk about the fall. I want to censor around three more episodes, or really just a pair of episodes and then the finale. Let's talk about Blister. Whoa! You two need to learn to respect your elders. So, you're gonna spend the whole day with them. Because of their antics, Fee and Fu get sentenced to being within this old folks home. Fu and Harvey go off as this episode is centered around Fee. Mind you, both Fee and Fu don't have parents. And it does appear that within this series, Harvey's parents sort of tolerate, sort of parent, sort of ignore them. It's as complicated as it may seem. So Fee's preconception of old people are your standard ones. Old, boring, slow, you name it. Until she meets Blister. Hey, put that down. Make me. No. Hey, what gives, man? You jinked up my pudding. Hey, give that pudding back. You mean this pudding? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a tough relationship because both Blister and Fee are rough people. In fact, they lie together to Officer Fred here, the Enforcer, I think, which builds a bond that they both don't like authority. Fee and Blister are pretty much still rough after that for the majority of the episode, however we as the audience understand Blister more. He was just like Fee when he was younger. He caused trouble, he caused mayhem, but because he was in this home later on for years, he hasn't had that eternal flame light up to go outside and cause mayhem and have fun like he used to. I'd love to do that again. What's stopping you dude? Let's get out there and tear it up! Eh, I haven't been outside in 20 years. 20 years? So all Fee wants to do is show him that outside is still as great as he remembers. In doing this, this episode gives clever clues with the way that Blister may reject the idea, but still compliment outside, showing a contradiction with what he's saying and how he's feeling. They even use antics like money for some odd but funny reason and trying to ignite his love bug by showing his long lost lady friend, but that doesn't even get him to go outside. What's fun, Blister? Is bingo fun? Is taking pills fun? Are those annoying nurses fun? I have allergies. Lies! I have a, a, a prior engagement. Liar! I 
I'm scared. This all comes to a height when Fee, rather than going back inside, would rather get zapped by Officer Fred, who is just all kinds of funny with his extremely animated ways and great voice direction. This is the fire that ignites Blister. Not money, not love, but passion from those who care about him. Thanks, Free. Yeah, Nickelodeon doesn't see the passion in episodes like this. I'm sorry it's not SpongeBob's Place, a pretty terrible episode that aired the same week as this, or Atlantis Square Pantis, but sometimes there's other emotions other than laughter and disgust that can sell. And the reason I bring this up is because the next episode that I wanna talk about does something that no other show that I brought up, not SpongeBob, not Breadwinners, not Sanjay and Craig, not Pit Go Banana Cricket, not Bunsen is a Beast, not the Fairly Odd Parents ever did for me. Blister dies, and here is the episode centered around it. So if you remember, these two have very similar viewpoints on how they see the world and how they want to spend the day. Both of them are very harsh, but in a childish way. And to see them together really gave Fee that older figure that she really needed. Even down to them pranking others with slingshots and pudding. The same pudding that introduced them earlier. It's made clear that Fee has found someone just like her. And when you see Fu, who is more carefree and glows with the flow, and Harvey, who like we saw isn't really mean, you can see how these two bonded. What's happening tomorrow? Only the biggest, most incredible prank I've ever pulled. It's called Operation Hedgebutt. So like the clip showed, Blister has a big prank tomorrow, and that's all that's on Fee's mind. So one thing I want to get across, and I want to preface to this episode, is that they do not sugarcoat this. They do not sugarcoat this topic at all. We just got a call from the nursing home. We mean, Blister passed away. Passed away? Wait, you mean he... he... died? They use words like passed away and died, dead. Words they don't generally use. I don't know if this episode is a blessing in disguise as being on Nicktoons gives room for more leeway, but an episode on handling death to a child can be quite the experience if done right. So at first they seem sad until Fee remembers... Oh. The biggest, most incredible prank I've ever pulled. I mean, he couldn't die before the best prank ever, right? And, uh, and then it happens. Okay, you guys ready? Yep. Then let's crash this funeral. But first, let's get into our costumes. Oh, also, Randall, Blister is your father. Huh? What's going on? Ah! <gasps> Sacre bleu! This is so sacrilegious! So glad you asked, madame. He's right here! W where's Blister? Never have I seen something so cringeworthy, but funny, but kind of not, and actually sad because you kind of know where this is going to go. She was so convinced because of her stubbornness that this had to be a part of the big prank. To her, why would this not be? He seemed perfectly fine before and they never built up that he had any issues, but this hits her hard, and, and not just hard, but in front of everyone. The way this sign blows in the sky, the way she gets a bunch of items that we've seen before, it finally hits her. Blister is gone. Hey, Tommy, if you're reading this, then that probably means I'm not around anymore. I guess I just wanted to say thanks for reminding me how fun the world is. I'm so glad you were in my life. You better keep raising heck in my honor. Later, barf butt. While brief, it was a neat relationship built up and removed, and they had other episodes of Blister as well. And when you take into consideration that Fee already lost her initial parents, this was such a hard blow that she takes fairly easy after this letter. This improves her character, and it shows that she's much more than the rowdy Tom girl. She had to be this way for Fu and her own survival, so she's built for this. And honestly, this may be my favorite episode from Harvey Beaks, but it gets even better. And I want to end this on a positive note. Let's talk about the finale. Excuse me, little girl. Have you seen these two babies?
Mom? Dad? These are Fu and Fi's parents. They haven't been seen up to this point, and it seems like they relate more with Fu than with Fi. It does, however, go with why Fi stepped up to the plate to be the reasonable one, which seems weird because she's still very childish. Fi is not excited to see her parents at all, much more the opposite. Where have they been? How come it took them so long to get here? Well, as they explain the story, they say that the pair left them when in reality, come on, look at this, it was the other way around, but they wouldn't have known that. You can see that this family is weird, and it seems to be more on Fu's level of weird. They give snakes, and they have weird rituals. And it's actually similar to Rolf and Eden and Eddie, where the weirdness has a logic to it, and it does seem to be consistent with this faraway culture that I know nothing about. But even with this, that does not convince Fi. What am I gonna do, Harvey? They're total weirdos. I always imagined my parents would be more like, I don't know, your parents. It comes to a point where Fi is self-aware that Harvey's parents have somewhat given Fi and Fu a home and a place to grow and develop. Fi tests them, which is probably the weakest part of this episode, but I understand it. This entire episode is sort of an emotional roller coaster, and to have some comedy helped, and I guess I can go against my bias on that one. Fi is not satisfied with their parents at all, thinking they're weird, and seeing how supportive Harvey's parents are, and how Harvey turned out, she wants nothing to do with them. Then, and if you've seen the show, you would understand this a lot better, Fu, who at this point in the series, for the most part, doesn't seem to hold an intelligent thought, says the best line of the finale. How can I be with them? They left us alone all those years. I guess I don't see it that way. Cause to me, they looked for us all those years. They show parallels of Fi and Fu trekking on their own, and how hard it can be to their parents going through the same amount of trouble to find them, and that's such a powerful scene. It shows as much as Fi and Fu have been wandering, their parents never stop searching for them. As much as that time has been wasted in Fi's perspective, I'm assuming the thousands of times that they circled the mountain looking for their offspring explains why Fi and Fu are in so many episodes of this series. A lot of that time was just their parents circling the mountain. Weird flex, but okay. But Fi embraces her mom, and even though she had to be both the mom and dad, she now has her own. I look at the time and this seems to be wrapping up around the 11 minute mark, but this is a half an hour special, so what's the other half about? So, um, I'm cool with my folks now. So you guys are gonna be our neighbors now, huh? Uh, no. Fu and I will go home with them. We're leaving Little Bark. I know what you're thinking. It's actually not about fighting their position to stay. They actually do go. But they give an origin story, which doesn't fit within the episode. But I appreciate it as it's dedicated fan service to those who want to know how Fee, Fu, and Harvey ended up meeting. It was rough at first, just like with Blister. They seemed to act like scavengers because they were. Fee is just a little more, uh, here to earth than Fu, and that's all she has. No home, no parents, just Fu. And as you can tell, she's very hurt by this, even if she doesn't show it openly at first. Uh, we don't have parents. What do you mean? I don't know, we just don't have parents. What, is that weird? But who takes care of you? It's just me and Fu. Sorry? Fu and I have to go. Bye! It also explains why Fi is so angry. She did not want to grow up the way that she did, and even towards the end of the episode, she seems calmer, happier, like her inner problem was solved. I also enjoy the way she connected with Harvey here, it's so unorthodox. I guess that's kind of the word of this video, unorthodox. Even though Fi and Fu are technically not Miriam and Irving's offspring, they do take care of them, and it shows how they all connected so well, even if the other kids are kind of put off by them at times. But as the story goes, unfortunately, they do have to go. Harvey? What? <laughs> Harvey? <laughs> Fu, help me out here! <laughs> I'm gonna miss you. You know what? Come here. <laughs> okay, bye. It's so deep or weird that the season starts off with an addition to Harvey's life and ends with a departure. This episode ends with the letter being sent back and that's the show, just wow. If you enjoyed this video, you'd love my 2018 reviews of Nick and Cartoon Network that I put here. Click on these cards and go watch them. Special thanks to the patrons of February and until next time, Take care. Alpha out.